just before we start today. And I'm holding a contest to thank loyal listeners by giving away copies of the books featured on the show. You don't have to purchase anything, give reviews or any of that. All you have to do is go onto Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram and post using the hashtag marketing books, all one word. It can be about which show you heard or what you're reading. Just make sure you use that hashtag and there will be multiple draws and you'll be eligible in each draw until you win. I'm going to do one for every book that I have and I'll do more draws every few months. Now I'm only telling listeners about this. So once you enter, your odds of winning are actually really good. Get in on this offer by posting something hashtag marketing books by midnight, January 15th of 2022. And now we'll get to the show. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Here we explore how to upgrade our lead generation. Today, we get into a book that explains digital well enough to get everyone oriented in the right direction. But first, let me remind you, this is part of a series that we're covering marketing books in, especially for the holidays. And if you have an idea for a book, please share it with me. Reach out to me on social at Funnel Reboot or at Hakelin S. Leave a form or a voicemail via the link on our site. To get to today's show, some of the books that these episodes feature drill way down into a niche or are written with a bit more of a theoretical bend to them. Well, not this time, because I found a book that gives a good sense all around of what digital entails. The act of rotating yourself with one foot anchored is called a pivot. The mechanism that our bodies use to face a new direction always uses a pivot. And that is why I think it's the perfect analogy for how people should think as they move fully into digital marketing. For those of you who've been with the podcast for a while, you may know that the first five episodes were all about dealing with digital. And I think I was channeling the same feeling that the author of this book, The Digital Pivot, had as he explains the ins and outs of moving into digital. Our guest is also the author of Social Marketing to the Business Customer. He's able to cover many things. He has advised companies like Boeing, Johnson & Johnson, Lucasfilm, the Pentagon, the Olympic Games. As well, he's the founder of a SaaS software company, which was one of the first of its kind in the marketing space. Let's welcome Eric Schwartzman. I'm super glad to welcome Eric Schwartzman. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Glenn. I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to have you and to talk about this book, The Digital Pivot. Its uh, subtitle is Secrets of Online Marketing. So let's maybe first talk about how we want to include people in online marketing, even those people who may feel left behind, um, or maybe they are at a level in a company, they're senior and the digital stuff has been happening, but they haven't been too close to it. Am I right in guessing that, you know, you really wanted to make sure that this net brought everybody into the current era? Yeah. I mean, the book is for people who had their heads down, they were working on their business. And next thing they knew, they're living in a digital universe. And, you know, how do you catch up? Where do you start? That's what the book's about. You know, I didn't want to write an inside baseball book for people who already know about digital. I think about like my mother-in-law who, you know, is still asking me what I do. And I I try my best to answer. Right. Um, And I felt like, you know, I need a book that she can understand or that, you know, you know, my, my son's grandfather can understand. And I think that's what this book is. I mean, it's a general purpose uh, reader book. It's for a business person who's interested in understanding what digital is, how it changes business, without having to uh, have an an MBA in digital marketing just to read the book. 
I don't disagree, but I will also say that people like me can still benefit from it. Uh, I think of, you know, what they do in, in, you know, spring training camps for baseball, right? And you're seeing these multi-million dollar earning pros and they're working on how to throw the ball, how to walk up to the batting, uh, you know, to the home plate, how to take a base. The fundamentals, um, when we're reminded of them, I think it has some benefit for even grizzled old, old folks like us because it helps us make sure that we're not missing anything and that we're really understanding how they all fit together. Well, the truth is, I think there's, you know, this stuff is still so new. There's a lot of misunderstanding, even among people who have been marketers their whole life about how to get into digital, you know, something that looks elegant and effortless actually takes an insane amount of technical skill and discipline to, to perform. You think about something like, and this is why I called it the digital pivot. Um, you think about a ballerina who performs a pivot turn or pirouette, as ballet masters call them, on the tip of her toe, supporting her entire weight. You know, something like that looks fantastic. And you think, wow, isn't that marvelous? But you don't know the decades of sacrifices and practice that went into getting the apprenticeship before they could actually make their way on stage and perform this beautiful pivot turn. And I think the same is true with digital marketing. People look at someone who's got a lot of engagement on Facebook or Instagram and they think, wow, I want to do that. But they don't understand the steps that come before that. And the truth is there is a logical sequence to accelerating a digital pivot. And that's kind of what the book's about. You know, I walk you through the different channels of media, owned, shared, earned, and paid in that order um, to accelerate the amount of time it takes to actually be successful online. So many people don't understand the difference and they try to do it all at once and you can't boil the ocean and you basically get nowhere and it's, you know, can be very disappointing and frustrating. So, you know, what I wanted to do was give people a framework. People who are business people, they understand marketing. Maybe they understand websites and they understand social media and they understand advertising and they know something about PR, they don't necessarily know how to sequence those different channels as part of a digital pivot. And that's really what the book's about. And one thing that you don't make a secret of is the fact that you are taking people through a logical order. Now, this isn't your typical five point, here's how you do it, cookie cutter recipe, but you do start off, for example, with those media channels. And you're getting into how things like owned and shared and paid, they all have to come to an epicenter on a website. And you need to know the basics of what it is to have a website and to have the data that is being collected on a website. Can you tell me a little bit about how we need to work in this data and how, when it starts to get out of hand, we need to maybe consider skilling up or hiring outside experts to wrangle the data for us. So, yeah, I mean, I do in the book say square one is making sure that your metrics are in order because you can't improve what you can't measure. Uh, But just to take a step back from there and just sort of look strategically at the digital landscape, um, I, I kind of like this analogy of a homeland embassy strategy. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't build an embassy before you had a homeland, right? You'd build the homeland first. So really going out onto social and building a presence for an organization without having your own website that you own is foolish because whoever controls the layout controls the payout. Mm. So so really, you know, you you want to control the customer relationship. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, during the pandemic so many independent restaurants to stay alive uh, made a a mad dash onto Square for restaurants. And that's basically a platform that they were able to use to accept orders from Uber Eats and Grubhub and, um, you know, all the other food delivery apps. And it also had an integrated um, uh, screen for the kitchen prep so they could pack the orders. And they thought, this is great. I'm staying alive here. And then they look back six months later and they realize, man, I'm paying 60, 50, 40 percent 
yeah. out of every order. Is this sustainable? Probably not. Um, you know, Uber Eats, Grubhub, these guys are getting paid from the customer. They're getting paid from the restaurant. So because these restaurants didn't have their own homeland, they were living only in an embassy. They basically were digital sharecroppers. Yeah. Whereas those companies that had their own infrastructure, like I think I saw some news that said Domino's profits, you know, in the fourth quarter, right after the pandemic were through the roof because of their app. And then all the other um, restaurants that were uh, franchises started doing curbside pickup through their apps. But, but, you know, really it's about controlling the customer relationship. It's about media ownership. If what you're doing is selling on someone else's network, like a third party reseller on Amazon marketplace, yep. you really, I mean, once you start go, doing good, they're just going to launch a competitive brand against you and demote you in the rankings. So really, I mean, you got to start with what I call owned media and owned media is your website. You know, it's about SEO. It's about making sure that you have a conversion funnel in place that works. And once that's working, then you're ready to start going out onto social media and building some community. And then from there, you're ready to start doing some PR because the first thing a journalist is going to do nowadays when you pitch them on writing a story about you is check out your website. Sure. And if it doesn't look like you're ready for business, you're not going to get the story. The second thing they're typically going to do is go down to the footer of your website and look for the link to your Facebook page and your YouTube page. And they're going to go there and they're going to see, you know, do you have 12 subscribers on YouTube? Hmm. Cause if you do, maybe they're going to say, well, maybe they're not ready yet. They're, they're still a small company. They're not real. So really, you know, the way that journalists kick the tires now is they look at your website, do you look legitimate? And then they look at your social community and they say, well, are they engaged or are they a ghost? Now, don't get me wrong. You don't need a million followers. It's sure. not what I'm saying. You need enough so that I know that you're not a ghost. You know, that there are people engaged with you that are in the community that are reputable. And that sort of, you know, is a voucher, shall we say. And once I've got those two things, then I can go say, hey, you want to write a story about me? Then maybe you get the story. And those three channels together, right? That's owned, shared, and earned. Yep. Those three together are, we, are what we call organic digital marketing. And then the fourth is paid digital marketing. That's advertising. And my feeling is, you know, if you're not VC funded, if you don't have deep pockets and you're not looking to sort of get engagement very quickly because organic does take time. You're better off doing organic first, making sure the wheels are, are in motion and everything's working out before you spend money on advertising. Because what's the point inviting people over to your house if you have nothing to serve them? That's you know, right. so th that's sort of the logical sequence. Uh, it, it, they fall together uh, into a cohesive strategy, right? And you can tell when companies have not done their thinking through of that strategy because it looks all disjointed. And like you said, a journalist will catch it. A buyer will catch it. it, it it's very obvious if you do it. Um, Honestly, it's, Glenn, it's not intuitive. It was never intuitive to me. I mean, I learned this through doing it. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years now. And, you know, just in the fields, fighting the battle for big companies, for small companies, duking it out. That's how I learned this. And really, it was when the pandemic hit, I said, you know what? I need to get all this down into one book so that someone who wants to understand digital marketing and doesn't want to have to get a freaking MBA can mm -hmm. sit down and read an interesting book with some funny stories and a few jokes in there and come away with an understanding of how digital marketing works. Now, you're not going to be an expert at digital marketing if you read my book, but you're certainly going to know who to hire in what order and you're going to know you're not going to get fleeced because you're yeah. going to understand how things work. Exactly. And I think the main area that we have to watch because even outside of the server service providers, the platforms, the biggest gatekeepers of the internet, the media publishers, the search engines, the social platforms, the one thing that they have on all of us is data. They've got scads of it and, you know, they've hired, as you say, the best engineers on the planet to, to run their data shops. Now, we can't match that, obviously, but you pretty quickly in the book get into the tech stack that we need to have and how its job is to 
manage our data, and to help us actually run our business better. Tell, tell me how you like to approach a tech stack. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, when we first got started with this whole digital business, you know, over a decade ago, we thought, oh, this is great because you just launch a website and then you're done. You sort of got this website and you're finished. Well, no, it never really worked that way. The web was always more of a communications channel than a publishing channel. And so if you think about it, right, if if the person who's responsible for communicating via the web on behalf of an organization is dependent on a tech person to get their content online, that's a bottleneck. Yeah. Um, tech resources are stra- it's very tech resources are expensive. Nobody's got enough of them. And typically, you know, publishing to the internet falls to the bottom of the stack. Um, so the way I got into digital is I was working uh, as a director of promotions at a large international PR firm. And um, uh, I, I was doing PR at the Grammy Awards. And it's interesting at the Grammy Awards, uh, backstage at the Grammy Awards, it's a 20,000 square foot press room. I, for wow. the Canadian visitors, I can't translate that into meters. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Very but, funny. But the way it works is it's, you know, 5,000 square feet for, for, uh, for, for photography, 5,000 square feet for news, 5,000 square feet for electronic, which at the time was television and radio, yeah. and then 5,000 square feet for what we called the one-on-ones. And that was almost like a mini trade show area where everybody got a 10 by 10 spot, the big broadcasters, and they would come in with talent and a set, and they would make like a little studio where they could do one-on-one interviews. And so what we would do is we would meet the winner backstage in the wings, Grammy in hands, and say, hey, come on into the press room. Come on into the press room, right? And they'd be like, yeah, well, we want to go party. We're not, we don't want to do, no, 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 do the press room. Right. So, and then, you know, they're, they're, they'd have their entourage, their agent and their PR person saying, no, no, you should do the press room. So we'd take them in and we'd take them into the uh, photo room where we had a bleacher with about three, 400 paparazzi. Wow. And the light bulbs would go off over here, over here. They'd be calling to him, Brittany over here, Brittany over here. And these light bulbs would go off. It, it was like Christmas. It was so exciting. And all these flashes, it would last, you know, in, in, in a matter of a minute, thousands of impressions that would be global for, you know, 12 months were, were collected. Then we'd move them into the newsroom. That was basically a classroom setup. So you have journalists, they have something to write on. Um, everyone barks questions. And there's nothing exclusive that happens there. Everybody gets what's said. Then we took them into the uh, electronic room and they had pool cameras. So we actually provided the cameras and the recording equipment. They would park a media bus, pull a recording. Again, nothing exclusive. And then the one-on-ones, of course, where where the one-on-one interviews would happen. Um, And that, you know, really, it was only best new artist, uh, best album, just the really big stars that were welcome in the one-on-ones, you know, everyone, you'd have all these PR guys trying to pitch their guy to go into the one-on-ones. Yeah. Yeah. A little uncomfortable. What can you do? But that's the way it worked. Right. So the last year I worked at the Grammys, there was a new room. It was called the internet room. (laughs) Okay. And, um, this is early days. This is pre Facebook, pre YouTube, uh, pre Twitter. Um, really, I think at the time WordPress is just maybe in, in, in its infancy yeah. and, um, and they're going to try to do two things. They're going to try to do text, live chat and live photo uploads, which what it was like at the time, huge. And, and so we're walking by, you know, cause our job is to escort the talent through the press room. We're walking by with, you know, the biggest rock and roll and pop artists in, in, on the planet with their entourages. And, you know, we have to convince them. And so we would come by the internet room. We would say, hey, here's the internet room. Do you guys want to stop in the internet room? And they, there was kind of, they would kind of look at you with a quizzical face and say, the internet room? No, no, no. No, no, we just want to do MTV and then we're out of here. Yeah. So we couldn't get anyone to stop in the internet room. I think we got like, you know, best gospel artist and sure. best new age single. You know, I mean, exactly who wasn't welcome in the one-on-ones. Yeah. They ate them up in the, uh, in the, in the internet room. Cause there was nothing else happening. Um, but I remember seeing that and thinking to myself, okay, we've been 
credentialing media for six months in advance of this event yeah. to get into this press room. We've been turning 80% of the requests away because of fire marshal restrictions. We can't accommodate anyone. We don't have the physical space. We'd love to. We want to generate as many news impressions as we can, yeah. but it's just not possible. So um, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wait a minute, the internet comes into the press room. And I'm also thinking, you know, if you've ever been in the press room for an event like that, it's much more exciting than it is on stage, yep. you know, and in the house. Yep. And I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. You I mean, you can bring the press room in now with the internet into an event. Right. And I actually left that. I left the agency I was working with and I launched a company called IPR software. Uh, bootstrapped it, built it up. Uh, we, we, we were the first online newsroom management service so that a PR person could manage the newsroom component of a corporate website. And, you know, uh, the, our clients, uh, included target Toyota, LinkedIn, Xerox, you know, the forever 21 biggest brands in the world, built it up to a multi-million dollar company, sold that company. Um, and that's kind of, that was how I got into digital. And, and I remember, and I was the founder of that company. So as that company was growing and social was growing, clients were coming to us and saying, Hey, how do we get social? How do we do social in our newsroom? And we started to integrate social media into the newsroom. Yeah. And so it was really by necessity, you know, that I was sort of forced onto the bus to digital land first. And, uh, you know, it's just by kind of the uh, serendipity of this event that happened with result of, of launching this business that I was able to get a head start and think wow. about that stuff in advance. Yeah. And you fleshed out, you know, some of that stuff where you said the publishing side of the web was deficient, right? And when you look at tools like that, I mean, by virtue of the fact that you were so early, you had to make your own tool. But in the book, you say, we don't have to do that anymore, or we do not. If we're going to do so, it. So we better have a good reason. So you're focusing me. So you're getting me back to stacks. Okay. So stacks. So, you know, you've got, if you've ever been, this is a, an analogy I use in the book. So if you've ever been on a, a motion picture studio tour, uh, um, uh, Universal Studios or any of these Disney Studios tours, uh, you've been on the on a back lot of the, of a motion picture studio, and you see that on the back lot of a motion picture studio, they build these facades on the sides of stages, and they're not real buildings; they're just facades. Like if you were to open one of the doors, you know, there's maybe enough room to kind of kind of sneak in there. But I mean, yeah, it's not it's, a functioning. It's a couple house. of two by fours that are just nailed together. Yeah. And if they want to do a scene with somebody on a, in a second story window, they give them a ladder, you yeah. know, it's a total fake out. Yeah. And really, I think that's what a website is. You know, websites, just a facade. So if all you've got is a content management system like WordPress or whatever else you may be using Shopify to power an online presence uh, without anything hooked up into it, without a way to take information and interact with people via the web, you've just got a facade, you know, no one, you can't do business. So you think about, well, what does that mean? Well, you got to have forms. People have to sign up. Well, when they sign up, where does that go? Well, it goes into a customer relationship management software package, a CRM. And uh, if you want to search engine, optimize your site so that it's likely to come up high in Google when people search for keywords, that are indicative of the problems you solve, then you need a tool for that. Um, at a base level, you know, you, you need a CRM, you need a content management system, you need a forms tool. You probably need some tool for email autoresponders, right? And you see, you know, how, how these tools have to interop interoperate with one another, which, and that's what we, we mean when we say a stack, a software stack. Right. We have these right. different tools from different vendors that are integrated with each other. There's pretty much two ways to go. You can buy a uh, vertically integrated stack from one company, and that's what most enterprise companies do. They buy an integrated stack from Salesforce or from Oracle or from Siebel or from NetSuite. And then you've got you know small companies that really can't afford 
the time and energy associated with customizing these full scale stacks. And they build what's called a best of breed stack. So they'll take MailChimp and WordPress and Gravity Forms and Yoast uh, Premium for SEO. And they'll put a little stack together that way. Maybe they'll plug in Zoho, which is a poor man's um, CRM, right. um, inexpensive, and, and put a stack together that way. But really, a digital business is a collection of tools that are interoperable, that talk to each other. And it's really, if you don't have a stack like that, you really can't compete against Amazon, against uh, um, Grubhub, against any of these big monolithic tech brands that are basically, you know, keeping their customers from having their customer contact information. If you sell something on, on Amazon, you don't get the customer contact information. Right. You don't get the right. card. Well, you, you get 30% them, if you're lucky. You hold them up as an example of folks that used their stack. And instead of building that Hollywood facade, they worked so hard on a fully formed structure that holds their data and allows uh, their business to function, that it actually made their business model stronger. And that's how they got to disrupt an industry. So, you know, you, you kind of, you, you give a carrot and a stick here. You're like, okay, on the stick side, don't chintz out, you know, make sure that you have integrations, think them through, uh, especially if you're going best of breed, because you may not uh, like it if you're, you know, thinking you can just get by with a bit of Zapier or something. But on the plus Careful side, of Zapier. Careful yeah, of the middle I know. Because what's required to support those integrations is debilitating. You know, before we picked up the phone, before we did this interview today, Glenn, I was working on a campaign for a client. Uh, it's a it's a uh, Black Friday campaign. Yep. And it's one of those bars that appears at the top of the website. So you go to the website and the whole screen pushes down on the little bar loads at the top. Yep. And it says preferred pricing for email subscribers. And you put in your email and then it sends you back an email uh, with a, um, you put in your email address, it sends you back a autoresponder email. Yep. It's got um, coupon codes to allow you to get discounts on holiday gift packages. <clears throat> so. The, the, the pop-up campaign is driven by a tool called Opt-in Monster. Yep. And there are others, it's just the one I happen to be using here. Yep. When you fill out the form, that information gets entered into MailChimp. And then MailChimp sends you back the, the email. And then, of course, you know, we've got an e-commerce store where we're setting up the packages that you can buy. And everything is hosted on a, on a WordPress site. So, you know, I'm, that's, that's integration right there. That's a stack. It's a, it's a simple stack that yep. any business could use. I'm not a coder. I don't need to be a coder to set these things up, but I do have to be, you know, technical enough to figure out how to plug and play and test them and make sure they work and take the time to do it. So that's an example of a stack at work in the wild. Yeah. And if you do it properly, I mean, it will actually make your business Thrive. That's the, the upside is you can mold it around your business model. And I think what it what I was helped in appreciating was from a marketing standpoint, none of that time is wasted. If there's a piece of information of data that's collected on a form by marketing, but way over in another part of the company, customer service is trying to help that customer and they can see that little piece of information, man. The, the stack has done its job and the customer leaves happy and the customer and the company can continue to grow. If, if you wanted to break it down in terms of um, uh, what they do, what these tools do for the business and just make it real simple, you could say digital marketing is about leading a horse to water and making them drink. Um, the leading them horse to water part is the organic marketing. Yeah, that's the, you know, the, the website and this and the social and the earned and the paid. But then once they get there, right, you want to convert the traffic into a transaction, into a lead. That's the making the drink part. And that's the part we call conversion rate optimization. And there's a chapter in the book about conversion rate optimization. How once you have the traffic, what's the point of traffic if you're not making money off of it? And so, of course, you know, if you're just leading him to water and not making him drink, you're not successful. 
And of course, you can't make them drink if there's no one you're leading the water in the first place. So really, it's a two part process. Yeah. And when you talk about how you're going to lead the horse to water, um, you know, I hope folks listening here aren't still thinking that uh, it's only going to be by collaring them through a sales call. Um, You say near the beginning, you still have to sell, but you don't have to prospect. So when they start to get out onto various channels that you've mentioned, and they're bringing them back into your website, um, you're a proponent of like, giving a lot of content and answering a lot of questions, right, Eric? You want that buyer to make sure that you as a company know their problem and that you are the one who can solve it. I think also I I don't want um, to waste my time with tire kickers. So I'd rather people self-educate. I mean, I'd rather, you know, that know that when someone wants to talk to me, that they that they've checked me out. They know that I have what that that I have what they want, and and it comes goes back to you know I I built the uh, online newsroom for Toyota years ago. Yep. And I remember when I was in the initial meeting with them, they said, you know what, we don't want people coming into the dealership unless they're ready to buy. So build this newsroom so they can find anything that they need to know about our cars out. It's funny, you know, newsrooms used to be just for journalists. But what happened with the internet is the press tent became now open to everybody. Yep. And so now when you're building, you know, a news center online, you're appealing to, you know, not just the media, you're appealing to customers, you're appealing to p- potential employees, uh, yeah. you are, are talking to competitors. I mean, you're, you can't segment your audience effectively anymore on the internet. The internet frustrates segmentation. So really, I mean, that's what we mean by democratization of information. You know, just to track back on, a, on sort of close the loop on the whole PR thing. When I was in PR, if I couldn't get press for a client, they would typically leave. They would cancel. They would, they would fire me. And the way it works is, you know, PR people don't control the press. No. You know, you're, so, so you really don't have any control if you keep your clients or lose them, it's just if, if they get press or not, if they get press and it works out great. And if it doesn't, it's you're done. Right. And I remember when social media came about and the internet, I thought to myself, well, that's going to be awesome because now I won't have to depend on the media to get my story to the, the customer of, of the client. Sure. And I celebrated that. I thought, you know, these gatekeepers are unfair and, you know, they have too much power and it shouldn't be this way. I didn't realize at the time that a guy named Alex Jones would put up a conspiracy website and tell people that water was being poisoned to make you a homosexual and then sell you a pill you know, at the same website where you could purify your water. I I didn't realize that. So I celebrated social media. I was a cheerleader. Oh, this is going to be great. I love it. And now look at where we are. We are in an infodemic where there is no truth. You know, there is no journalistic process by which information is evaluated anymore. And Even the journalists have lied uh, right. on the sides of the political aisle yeah. because they've been forced to because of engagement based algorithms, you know, where everyone's rubbernecking for a roadside accident. And, you know, one of the things that the guys from BuzzFeed said when they testified uh, before Congress was the stories that have done the best for us are the ones we're most ashamed of. Yeah. And so I didn't realize it would be a race to the bottom. And now I think we really are in a information crisis where it's it's delaying the recovery from the pandemic because there's so much misinformation out there about whether or not vaccines yeah. are safe. It's crazy. Yeah. It, and think of the hapless buyer who's just trying to find out about a company. You do say that the social media, you know, usage by employees, uh, you're a proponent of that. Um, and I gather that's because if you clam up and there's a vacuum caused by your company to talk about an issue or talk about what you do, then that's going to be filled with speculation, rumor, myth, or people are just going to go elsewhere, right? You want people not to shy away from social media because of that, but you're okay with even having employees talk about your company on social media. 
Well, I mean, you've got all these companies spending money trying to promote themselves on social media, and they're basically doing it through a branded account. Yep. So no one trusts, a, brands don't talk. It's discounted. A Coke can does, can't talk. Right. So when you've got this branded account with a picture of a logo and it's sharing about, oh, check out our new this and that, no one cares, right? And, and if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer for years, we've been seeing people trust people like themselves and subject matter experts, academics, that's who they trust. So everybody ha- is employing, every, every company is employing subject matter experts. Wouldn't you want them to speak on your behalf online? They're more trusted than your brand. Wouldn't you want them to retweet your stuff and comment on your stuff? Well, I mean, it seems like that, that to me made the most sense. It was the most logical way to go, but that's not what happened. What happened was legal departments came out with these social right. media policies that were so arduous, everyone just clammed up. And I think it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, you even say the byproduct, if you let them do their sharing, the byproduct of all that sharing would be marketing. Yep. I mean, what if there was no marketing? Yep. What if marketing was just the byproduct? of people educating one another about your products and services online. Because the truth is every time people self-educate online, there's a record of that. And that record is archived and can be discovered through search. So the more you can use these networks to transfer organizational intelligence onto the web, the more business you're going to do. Now people get scared. They say, oh, well, someone's going to say something they're not supposed to say. Look, I get it. Teach people what they can and can't say. All you have to do is draw the boundary between what can be said online and what can't be said online, and then just encourage them to use the open web for all those communications. And that's a natural way of marketing. Rather than trying to be authentic, you are authentic. (laughs) And people usually don't have a problem doing that. (laughs) It's when we try to put on a mask that we have a problem. Uh, yeah, leads- recreate it. Create. I hate this right. term content marketing. It's like yeah. it makes me want. It makes me want to vomit. You know, well, gee, the content marketing. What about just content? What about just information? What about journalism? Helping you know? solve problems. Right. Well, that would be the customer service side. But like, if I'm if I'm going to tell a story, I mean, I'm working with a client now. Uh, we're reviewing their competitors' products on their blog. Wow. People say, well, why would you do that? We don't want to promote our competitor. Why not? We got an affiliate program. If someone clicks on that link, we get paid on it. And now when you search for the affiliate, you find the you find my client. So I mean, really what you want to do is establish an online clearinghouse where people go for information that they can use to make purchasing decisions for whatever it is you sell. You know, and, and now, that the whatever it is competitors. Do it all day long. Right. And whatever it is you sell, though, there's a hitch there. And you pointed it out. You gave an example of a dog food company that you worked with. And if you are, well, it might not have been you. It might have been Robert Rose that you were recounting uh, and saying that, okay, this is a, the quick story is discount dog food seller wants to increase their online sales. And they think the solution is to, go and write all kinds of articles about the health issues that you might have with dogs and dog health and all this and that and the other. Would you counsel them to do that? Well, no, I mean, as Robert says, and, you know, and it's in the book, um, you know, why would you, I mean, people don't associate a, a, a low cost seller of dog food with, you know, where you would go for advice about your pet, you go to your vet for that. Right. So, you know, again, you get, it's got to be in line with what you're selling. All these things matter. You know, people don't really think through what it takes to create content. Well, and I think let's, the, let's what they that trip over the most, you do what they trip over the most. And this is, I encounter this with almost every client. Yep. You know, there's, there's not an appreciation for the difference between editorial content and promotional content. Yeah. Editorial content is what people use to make decisions. They don't use marketing content to make decisions. They use marketing content to evaluate a product. So if you think about the buying, the buyer journey, the customer journey, right? It starts with getting informed. 
finding out information, becoming aware. Right? Yep. Then you become you become you become problem aware. Then you start to search some brands, right? Then you become brand aware. Then you start to search who you want to transact with. So you sort of go, you know, from informational to commercial to transactional. And so, you know, you want to obviously have visibility anywhere someone comes onto that funnel. And and that's kind of where, you know, the this idea of own media comes in. The idea is you, you're not just creating self-serving media. You're not just creating a house organ. Because if you do, you're going to be discounted. People are going to bounce away. You, they have to go there and they have to get something that really is of value to them. I can't tell you, you know, I see these guys offshoring these uh, clients, offshoring blog posts to Pakistan, where they get these blog posts that are just cram full of keywords and, yeah. you know, sort of position just right to dupe Google into thinking that it's worth something. Well, what's the point? Because anyone's going to go there, they're going to bounce because it's illegible. So yeah. really, you know, making content is about making content. It's about hiring good writers. It's about teaching them how to tell a story. It's about having a hook. It's about having a thesis. It's not just about regurgitating what's already there. You know, it's not about being a thought repeater. It's about being a thought leader. You know, that's what it takes. And sort of those are the types of programs I run for clients, you know, creating original content divisions in their company that they can hopefully spearhead themselves after I get them launched. I sort of get them up and running and show them the ropes and step out of it. You give examples where it can take a fair bit of time. If you look at Anil Patel, he's writing articles that are 10,000 words or longer, and they are thoroughly researched. They are diagrammed. They have all sorts of things. What is it that would cause a business owner or a key leader in a company to give that kind of time or to sanction budget to be spent on that kind of effort? Um, is, is what you just said there about researching where the other people have already given their thought leadership and yeah. instead of regurgitating, is it about finding those niches where a gap exists and it can be used to provide that information that the internet might be looking for? Is you know, that, I is spent, that where the trade-off makes sense? I spent, you know, uh, the first five years of, of launching uh, IPR software, trying to convince people that the internet mattered. And I would literally go to these meetings and I would say, the internet's going to change everything. And they would look at me like, you know, what are you sure. crazy? We have yeah, web yeah, guys, yeah. they do this stuff, you know? Right. And, and now we're finally at the place where you don't have to convince people anymore. And frankly, if you do, I'm not interested in those accounts. Good point. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be on that, that world. There's so much demand right now in business for, for people like us who can help others transition to digital, people who can piv help you pivot to digital. I mean, it's really, I, for, from, my, from my view, it's more of a seller's market than it was before. It was more you know, of a buyer's market. So, I mean, in terms of where we are today, I'm not really... You know, I'm not, I'm not really playing on that sort of bleeding edge front anymore. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I, as a good testament, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, screw this guy, I, I'm still on the fence. Some things to look at, you know, what's happening now with a lot of companies is they're starting to buy for tens of millions of dollars, blogs, companies yeah. are buying Web properties. Blogs. Yeah. So, so HubSpot which is a um, provider of uh, online marketing tools to small business, uh, recently bought a, uh, a, 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 an email newsletter called um, Morning Brew. And uh, the whisper number is, you know, high seven figures, nine, 10 million, something like that. But I mean, here they are buying a freaking newsletter, an email newsletter, because the email newsletter has their clients. Yeah. Um, DraftKings, which is uh, an online betting brand, recently bought uh, Las Vegas Sports Authority.com, which was an online uh, stats site uh, to inform bettors. And they're just buying these sites so that they can link from those sites to their own domains and lift up the search rank. Yeah. So, you know, if you don't have that kind of money, build the site yourself. You know, get the yeah. right people, figure out the angle and build the site yourself. Now, you do have to have some faith 
It's not, it's not a slow game. Uh, it's not a fast game. If you want something fast, you got to buy advertising. That's fast. But if you don't have a stack that's prepared to convert that traffic into revenue, what's the point? So really you're looking at nine to 12 months to get your organic uh, marketing program up and running. You got to get your website in place. You got to get the, the uh, analytics in place. You got to get the content going. You got to get some search rank. Once you've got people in there, you got to build your social. Then you got to try to get some PR. Then you got to do the conversion rate optimization. Then you're ready for a little uh, advertising. That's really, I think, how most small businesses who are not VC funded, who don't have deep pockets, uh, that's how I'm seeing them transition successfully to digital. Yeah, I, I like it. And I'm going to return to one thing you mentioned earlier about the Edelman Trust Meter. And we'll put the link in that to the show Trust notes. Barometer. The trust barometer. barometer. Yeah. Sorry. Actually, you know what? Include the link. The most recent Trust Barometer, I uh, interviewed the director of intellectual property at Edelman about that report. Cool. And she was fantastic. Her name is T Tanya Reese. And you can link to it on my uh, podcast. People will love listening to that. Got it. When it comes to that, though, I think the word trust is probably the linchpin here. Uh, it's it's very hard to fake content that has that true editorial quality you speak of that really describes uh, things that people care about. Um, that is clearly going to eventually have a commercial value, whether it's the value of the asset or the fact that it brings in an audience and attracts them to the point where when they're ready to buy for something, who else are they going to talk to? But you've got to be, you've, you've got to be a genuine person you've got to be genuinely committed to being a trusted actor um, when you build this. You is, can't, you can't I'm glad it. you said that. Trust is a big part of it. You know, um, we have expectations of what trustworthy media online looks like, you know, based on our experience on reputable news sites, we have certain expectations. We expect a headline. We expect a byline. We expect a dateline. Uh, if there's a photo, we expect a caption. We expect it to look like an editorial photo, not like an advertising photo. Yeah. Um, we expect it to have paragraphs. We expect um, it to, the spelling to be correct. We expect the first sentence to really give us a nice hook and summarize the whole thing up, not give us something bland and boring. You know, these are expectations we have. And, and, and it even gets into aesthetics because if the typography of the site does, doesn't look professional, doesn't even matter how good the content is. No one's going to read it. So really, it's a, the first thing I do when I'm skinning up a site is I make sure that all the classes of information are styled appropriately. I typically will use the New York Times as a guide to wow. figure out how, what size I want my headlines. Is it going to be a serif font? Is it going to be a sans serif font? Is it going to be black? Is it going to be gray? Where's it going to go? How much space between the headline and the photo? Is the headline above the photo? Is it, is it below the photo? Where's the date line? Is it, a, is it up above or below the byline? Are we going to have a little picture of the author in there? You know, all these things are things we think about. And that's usually month one for me on an engagement with a client is just getting the freaking site looking good. Yeah, but it does pay off, as you said, you know, if we're going to even have a chance for virality down the road or even a long tail of search results, we've got to put that work in up front and uh, I love how you said it, that as a, as a population, you know, as any of us are also consumers, even if we're also business owners, as consumers, we're conditioned to expecting media to have all of those above board pieces of appearance. And if we're going to deal with a company and shell out our hard earned money for their product or service, we're going to expect the same. Indeed. I really appreciate you kind of taking us through all this, Eric. And if people want to find out more about the book or about you, where can they go? You can find me at ericschwartzman.com. And I'm fastest, uh, I reply fastest on Twitter at Eric Schwartzman. Fantastic. We'll have those links in the show note. And I want to thank you, listener, for being here. Listen, if you enjoyed this, um, I'm going to include links to both of Eric's very good podcasts on this show. 
I would encourage you just to keep learning on this stuff. And whether you find his podcast of a value or mine, you should subscribe to someone's on whatever app you use. And, and if you're a, if you're you know if you're a podcast listener, I would like to add the book is also available on Audible. I actually read it myself. Um, so you can down if you're an Audible subscriber, I think it's one credit. So yep. it's free. It won't cost you anything. And you can just listen to it as you, you know, drive to work or work out on the treadmill, what have you. I would highly endorse people look into using that. That's a great, that's a great tip. Well, listen, once again, thanks listener. And thank you, Eric. And I hope this helps you make your funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.